Thank you. Uh, Martha Kirilidou, it is my pleasure to welcome you to uh, the webcast on uh, uh, comprehensive approaches to defining library value. Then thank you for joining us. A couple of logistical um, things. Uh, everyone will be muted to cut down on background noise. We do welcome questions. Now, you'll have to type your questions, um, and ARL staff stand ready to answer all of them. Questions and answers that we do not address, as well as the ones we address during the webcast, will be distributed to attendees after the webcast, along with the recording that will be available on the ARL YouTube channel. Let me take a minute to... Um, briefly um, say that um, the uh, people that are here today with me uh, is my colleague Amy Yeager, the Library Relations Coordinator at the Association of Research Libraries. John King was not able to join today. I'm going to say a few things about uh, uh, what uh, his work is about, but uh, we'll also try to um, organize another session uh, with him. And we have here with us today our main speaker, Bruce Kinma, professor of the School of Information Sciences and the Whitman School of Management at Syracuse University. Bruce has done a lot of work on the economics of libraries and more recently on innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, so he's bringing a lot of valuable experience in uh, this field. The uh, goals of our session today is to help you become a little bit familiar with the LibValue uh, work, an IMLS grant uh, that uh, has been happening for the last three years. We want to understand the concept of value and its various dimensions as it applies to libraries and consider some of the methods that uh, we are developing uh, to estimate value. And last but not least, we want the audience to become familiar with return on investment methodologies, um, analytical methodologies, uh, basically, that uh, uh, help you demonstrate the value of your organization. Now, this is um, the fourth of six different webcasts we have been organizing on the Lib Value Grant. And uh, the Earlier, uh, three webcasts are already available on the ARL YouTube channel. The distinct feature of today's webcast is uh, this emphasis on the comprehensive approach of defining library value. And by that, we mean the total organization being viewed as a unity rather than distinct services uh, that we have featured before. Uh, for example, our earlier webcasts were on specific things regarding ebooks, on library common spaces, on undergraduate student success. The distinct element of today's webcast is the uh, comprehensive um, approach to defining library value. In that respect, it's actually quite similar to uh, the concept we have to parallel the concept we have in measuring service quality on LiveQual where it looks on the uh, total market um, approach and the total market definition of what service quality is. So similarly here, you'll hear about how to define a library value for the library organization as a whole. We do have two more webcasts coming down the pike in uh, June and in August. So a couple of words about the grant. The copy eyes on this grant are Carol Tenopier from the University of Tennessee and Paula Kaufman from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. ARL is a key partner in this uh, grant, and our main goal is to uh, see how we can take these tools and move them forward beyond the duration of the grant. We do have also key partners in this grant, and Syracuse University is one of our key partners uh, through Bruce Kinma. There, ha there are also a couple of other um, collaborations um, 
the GIST collections are uh, working closely with Carol Tenopier at the University of Tennessee in testing different aspects of library value. And, of course, all this work would not have been possible without the uh, support from IMLS, the Institute of Museum and Library Services. ARL has a long-standing interest in developing tools and for demonstrating uh, library value. Uh, historically, you know, the descriptive statistics of how many volumes and expenditures we have as reflected in the ARL statistics or what most academic libraries know as the um, statistics uh, that are um, being asked from them by the ALA division of academic libraries, the ACRL division of ALA. This is the same survey. ARL has been collaborating with um, ALA, ACRL uh, over many, many years to uh, have the same survey uh, being distributed to all academic libraries. So this is sort of the historical uh, basis of um, capturing the role of libraries. But in the last 10 years, we have moved aggressively towards developing new approaches. And the flagship approach has been LibQual. Uh, that's a standardized user survey that uh, defines a very robust model of library service quality as viewed by faculty and students. And it has been applied to more than 1,300 libraries, different languages, different countries. Um, we have also engaged in uh, approaches that are uh, more internal. A climate call, for example, is a standardized survey that looks into the organizational climate and diversity issues within a library environment. And we have also worked um, in the area of merging uh, resources and services with DigiQual and NSF uh, grant that looked into digital library service quality and the Minds for Libraries protocol that stands for measuring the impact of networked electronic services. It is a protocol uh, that focuses on the purpose of use and the value people derive from the use of electronic resources. So in this larger context of developing tools, LibValue has shifted the debate into, you know, how do you go beyond input measures? How do you go even beyond quality, service quality? And how do you articulate and capture outcomes and value as experienced by the user? And we've been testing a number of different uh, approaches over the last three years. Now, before we move on um, into um, the in-depth approach um, that Bruce will tell us. We have a poll question for you. And Amy will take the floor and read it for us. Good afternoon. I'm going to open the first poll question now. Uh, you should see a box pop up in the middle of your screen. And the question reads, has your library started looking into determining value and return on investment of your various services? And the response options are yes, no, or not yet, but we have discussed different approaches and are getting ready to implement them in the near future. We'll give them a minute, or oh, not a full minute, but a few seconds. <laughs> OK, I can see some responses beginning to come in. And we'll go ahead and uh, close the question now. And the results are? And the results are 43% uh, said yes, 36% said no, and 20% uh, said not yet. But discussing some approaches. Interesting. So the majority of the people um, have moved into trying to articulate value and outcomes. So it's a ready audience for you, Bruce. Thank you, Martha. This is Bruce Kingma. Um, I do want to say, Martha, thank you for doing that overview of uh, StatsQual, and, and thank God for ARL and uh, looking at uh, outcome measures and measures of uh, quality of services in the library community. It, it warms a social scientist's heart to uh, hear that organizations 
are, are actually looking into uh, collecting data on uh, the value of their services. Uh, so I'm Bruce King. Though. Um, those of you that don't know me, I have a PhD in economics. I'm a faculty member at Syracuse University, both in the business school and in the School of Information Studies here. Some of you might know me from my work in the 1990s on the cost of digital libraries uh, or on the, the costs of uh, interlibrary loans. So I've done a lot of cost studies in the uh, uh, library community um, and did some work in, uh, in early 2000 about the cost of online education, too. Uh, I was very pleased that Carol Tenniper asked me to be part of the LibQual team, or LibVal team, I should say. Uh, back a few years ago when we were putting the IMLS grant proposal together. Uh, and my role is to, I know you're listening to a, a number of the webcasts on the various services, but my role was really to come on board uh, as an economist and look at the comprehensive value, see if we could measure the, the return on investment of the academic library as a whole. Um, I can't resist but doing a few slides on the economics of, uh, of the library and the economics of education. This is sort of economics 101. And when we look at universities, universities to the, the typical student actually provide what economists call a, a private good, uh, which means that an individual exchanges their tuition. They pay for the service or the product that they get ultimately a degree, but also four years' worth of education and knowledge. Um, and that's, that's a private exchange of, of somebody paying for something that they receive. Academic libraries provide public goods, public goods uh, being an economic term, of a, of a good that when it's provided, it's provided to a number of people at the same time. It has joint consumption properties. And therefore, it's much more difficult to figure out the return on that investment for an organization. When you have a private good, you assume that the individual is willing to pay for at least the value that they're getting from it. They should be getting more value than what they've paid for that service. But when you have a public good, you have a number of people getting value from the provision of the one service, in this case, the academic library. And so you have to use tricky economic techniques to figure out how much value everybody gets from that service and then essentially add up across all the individuals to figure out whether the collective benefit is greater than, than the cost of the individual good or service. Um, so yes, this is uh, a, a bit of an economic conversation about the comprehensive value, uh, particularly in the context of uh, Syracuse University and with Don King's uh, work on some other universities, um, Drexel and Bryant. Um, so what is value then? That, that uh, stresses, you know, what are we talking about here? What, what are the benefit people, individuals get from the academic library? Well, I'd like to cut that into, into three categories. There is the economic benefit that an individual gets from using the academic library. I get value from logging into the library resources. I get value from going over to the library and physically using the resources. That's all something that's collected by me privately, as do all the other users or patrons of the academic library. There's also the environmental value, though, of the academic library services. And I think that's something that we've ignored over the last 20 years. But um, academic libraries have provided significant environmental value, and I think to some extent without even realizing it. The fact that we provide electronic services to patrons, the fact that I can log into my academic library's website and receive those services without having to drive over there, without having to expend resources to physically go to the library, uh, means that we are saving the environment, right? These are, these are um, resources that uh, have, have less uh, negative environmental impact and therefore this uh, positive externality on users. I used to say in the uh, 1990s when I talked about my own library that the best thing that the dean of the library has done for me is to keep me out of the library. And that was a time when all these electronic resources were becoming available. I could reach it at my desktop. And instead of having to physically drive to the library a couple of times a week to take use of uh, physical resources, 
uh, I could stay in my office and uh, visit the library every day, actually, but not expend resources to get there. And finally, there's the social value of the academic library. What do I mean by that? Well, it's, you don't have a good university, you don't have a great college without having a great library. The two go together. It's symbiotic. Um, so you know that you're at a good institution when you have a great academic library. There is a social value to the institution of having that piece of it, that piece of it well-funded, well-recognized, in a central location, as a hub for people to go to. Uh, it's a source of pride, typically, when uh, uh, high school students are taken on tours of the campus. They, they always pass by the library. The parents, the students feel better about the fact that they're coming to an institution. That's really a social value. That's not a value of use. That's not an environmental value of providing access to digital resources. That's, in some sense, you can call it a value of pride. I'm proud of my academic library. And that adds to the overall economic value. So how, do we, how can we estimate? What are the methods used to estimate value? Um, there's a variety of methods that have been used over the years. Uh, the basic one is size and assessed value. How much do we have? How big is our collection? How many electronic resources do we have? What do we have in special collections, and what is it worth? So it's sort of the, the stock value of what we have versus the flow value of the use of what we have. A uh, second way to estimate value that we've looked at is we have statistics on use and turnstile counts and downloads of resources and readership of academic resources at the library. How many times are things being used? And that's a signal of value. It's not exactly value, but it signals to us that w what we have purchased is actually being used and people are walking into the building and people are connecting to the website. We must be doing the right thing if people are using what we're doing. Uh, the third thing that we have on the slide is called contingent valuation, and it's actually a method that I use, that Don King uses, uh, that has been used over and over again in many of the public library studies that you see out there of the value of the public library. And that's really just a survey of individuals and asking them to try and get a dollar figure on what's the value of what they're using the academic library for. We'll go through that in a little bit more detail. And it's tricky to ask the question in a survey, and you've got to make certain you ask it in the right way. But it's really a question that comes down to, if you didn't have your academic library, how much would you spend to go somewhere else to get access to these resources? And we'll use that as a proxy of value for the resources that you get from the library. Uh, there's also financial uh, grants awarded. This is a study that was done uh, early on in, in the Lib Value work uh, by Judy Luther looking at the University of Illinois and tying back all the research grants that were collected at the, that were gotten at the University of Illinois back to the use of the library by the faculty that were principal investigators on those grants and saying, hey, we've got a correlation here, and if it weren't for the library, we would have not got, we would not have gotten some of these grants. Um, so that's a study that you should take a look at when you have a chance, showing how you can tie it back to, to grants. Um, and then finally, there's a, an economist's favorite tool, correlation and causation, trying to do a, a regression. On when we fund our academic library better, do we get better outcomes, and can we measure those outcomes? Do we get more grants coming in the door? Do we have a higher retention rate? Do we have a higher graduation rate? Are, are our students getting better grades? Are our faculty publishing more papers? So you can try and look at the outcomes that you hope for, relate it back to the funding or the resources that's going into the library, and seeing if there's a correlation there to try and get another proxy of the value of our academic library. Um, can we advance the slide? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so now it's a matter of going over uh, some of the prior research on the ROI of libraries. There are a ton of studies in the public library domain that go back, I think, uh, almost 20 years now, back to the study by Holtz on the St. Louis Public Library, which is the original one. And that's a wonderful study, but there are, are no shortage of studies since then. Um, I point to the, 
the 07 uh, really book by uh, Jennifer Arns and others uh, that uh, do, does a great job of summarizing those public library studies. Most of those public library studies use contingent valuation, use asking patrons how much is the value of the service provided to you. Uh, and you can see many of those studies, they're all over the board in terms of the return on investment, anything from 6 7 $8 down to $3 or close to $4 on ROI, meaning for every dollar going in, there's $4 or more of value coming out the other end. Um, there is some work on special libraries by uh, Yosemite Mary Griffiths and Don King, who unfortunately couldn't join us today, but he is, he is known for the individual that has done many of the studies on, in the special libraries domain and the value of special libraries. There's been very, very little research, surprisingly, on the value of academic libraries. Um, there is the study by Judy Luther that I pointed to uh, in uh, 2008. Uh, measuring the ROI of the, the library at the University of Illinois based on the amount of grants received at the University of Illinois. There's a wonderful study by Megan Oakleaf, one of my colleagues at Syracuse University. Um, that study really sort of summarizes the various values that we hope for out of the academic library um, and is a survey of the literature looking at what's out there and uh, really identifying and classifying where we might get value. But again, we haven't done a great job of measuring where we might get value. That's been the, the principal contribution of the Live Value study is looking at trying to measure um, all those uh, significant areas where the academic library provides value to the campus. Uh, there's a lot of great work by Carol Tenniper. Um I tell all my students to visit Carol's uh, website uh, at the University of Tennessee. She has all of her research linked there. She's got a great personal web page. And if you have the time, visit her website and look at particularly the value of readership and what faculty and students are doing in terms of accessing uh, the journals at uh, the library and that value. Uh, and then there's a paper out of this research that I wrote, uh, jointly wrote with uh, Kathleen McClure uh, that is out there as a working paper right now that we hope to get published uh, sometime soon uh, from the results that you're going to see today. So uh, a few things, warnings in terms of estimating value of libraries. Uh, and these are all sort of from the economist tool bag of things to remember. Um, it's important to think about estimating value and not use. Now, use is a proxy for value, but it's not exactly value. Uh, a good example is the case of users of late night libraries common space. The library might have a lot more users in the middle of the afternoon, but those that come late at night, there are fewer people there. They are you know, they're simply, you know, using it at a different hour. And sometimes you get the sense that they have a much higher value of that use. They might be the serious researchers, the people that are going there to get some work done versus the people in the afternoon that, you know, at least at our library, some of the students in the afternoon that use it more as a social experience. So while the use is less late at night, the value might actually be more because those individuals, you know, place more value in their, in their access to it at that time. Uh, we all know that e-resources garner a lot more use than physical resources. When we, when we move from the physical world of having a journal in print copy and providing that online, it seems like it exploded the number of uses that happened for that resource online. Um, that doesn't mean an explosion in value. That may mean that people are browsing it or just reading a paragraph out of it. Uh, and may actually have less value in each use. And you'll, you'll see that when I go through some of the numbers at Syracuse. Uh, a second thing to remember is uh, opportunity cost and the importance of our opportunity cost and the decisions that we make in the library. Uh, opportunity cost is, you know, it's a comparison of this or that. So if we, if we want to make, if we want to make more room for library commons, does that then make less room for books? Uh, and so we got to look at the value of the library commons, which may provide significant value for the users of that space, but just oppose that with the, the 
perhaps lower level of access that we're giving to some other resources and the value of those other resources. Um, and finally, and, and in some sense most importantly, estimating cost and value is difficult and a guesstimate based on history. Uh, what we show with the return on investment for many of these resources uh, is the data that occurred behind us and the value that individuals placed uh, in what they have. Even the survey that I'm going to show you the results from from Syracuse University, uh, it's uh, an expression in 2010 and 11 of the value that the faculty and the students placed in accessing the resources. Well, libraries have to be the most innovative part of an academic organization. They have to lead the way. Things are changing so rapidly for them with online resources, social media, library commons, etc. We have to be forward-looking. It's great to have this measure in time of what's the return on investment, but we can't forget that we have to be innovative. We have to be forward-looking. We have to think about the next great thing and the return on investment of taking that leap of faith and providing additional uh, resources and services to our patrons. Um, so just a quick overview of the library value study that you've already heard some webcasts on and we'll certainly hear more. It was broken down into scholarly reading, teaching and learning, ebooks, special collections, the value of the library commons, and these studies that uh, Don King and I did on the comprehensive value of the academic library. And we are Sorry for those who came later, you may not have heard that uh, Don is not able to join us today, but I do want to mention uh, a couple of things related to his approach, and we will try to organize another uh, occasion and cover uh, his approach uh, on a webcast. Uh, and before I go a little bit more into Don's um, material, Amy, do you want to go with our second poll question? The yeah, second poll question asks whether your library has ever estimated the cost per use or cost per user of any library services. And the response options are yes, we were asked by campus administrators to do this. Yes, we have done this as part of getting solid management information. Or no, we have not done any cost studies. Let's wait a moment for results. say that they have estimated costs for uses at the request of campus administrators, whereas 48% have done this uh, on their own, and 41% have not done any. This is very interesting. Well, uh, if Don were with us, he would say uh, you cannot do an ROI study without calculating the costs, and uh, that's uh, um, why, you know, it, getting a, a sense of how to do that is important, and he has devoted a lot of uh, what he has done on that part. He has um, uh, brought into the project uh, the two partners, Briant University and Drexel University, and he's uh, been applying his methods at uh, these two institutions uh, primarily. And here is an overview of those two settings. Um, as I mentioned, there will be a very extensive report coming out of, uh, of his work. Uh, the uh, couple of elements I want you to keep in mind about Don's approach is he has identified an extensive and comprehensive list of services. Uh, based on Briand and Drexel universities, a total of 77 services. And uh, he has uh, implemented surveys of the use of and values to faculty and staff and students. And furthermore, articulated uh, the cost analysis for each one of these services. And uh, when uh, we have his report, we'll have, again, a chance to look at all these methods that uh, he's developing um, based on that research. 
Now, uh, as we move forward and into uh, looking uh, from Don's approach to Bruce's approach, we have another poll question for you, Amy. Uh, the next question asks whether your library has ever surveyed users about the value of library services. And you can choose yes, we have surveyed faculty, yes, we have surveyed students, yes, we have surveyed both faculty and students, or no, we have not surveyed users. Close the poll. Looks like the, the most libraries have uh, surveyed both, 55%, uh, whereas 2% have surveyed only faculty, 2% have surveyed only students, and 39% have not done any. But some work still to be done uh, in many libraries. Uh, so let's see how we survey faculty and students. Bruce. Thank you, Martha. Uh, so back in 2010-11, uh, we implemented a survey, a contingent value survey of the, re the services at the Syracuse University Library. I have to say thank God for Suzanne Thorne, the dean of the library at Syracuse University. It is a leap of faith when a dean says, yes, you can survey all the patrons and ask them if they value the library. That is a leap of faith. Uh, to, to go with somebody hand in hand and say, we're going to figure this out, means that you're willing to expose yourself to what your faculty and students think of your library. So thanks to Suzanne Thorne, we were able to do this and, and her support um, for the survey. Uh, so we uh, surveyed faculty in the fall of 2010 and surveyed students in the spring of 2011, sort of at peak time. Asked them about a variety of services, asked them the value of those services. We have an extensive data from these surveys, and if you, uh, I think if you advance the slide one more, there, there may be actually response rates on those. Martha, if you try and, yes. So we got a great response rate out of faculty of 42% and a great response rate out of students of 98%. In large part, I have to say, because at the time I was serving as the associate provost at the university, and I think people responded to the survey because it was coming from the provost's office. Uh, we asked them, so there, there's a lot of data here, but for the purpose of this call, I'm only going to give you a, a short snippet, the, the sort of punchlines from the major question on contingent valuation. So we asked them about all the services they used over the last 30 days to try and get a fresh idea, asked them about the most recent service they used, recalling the most recent survey, service they used at the academic library, and then asked them if you couldn't have had access to that, how much would you have been willing to pay in time and money to get there from somewhere else? How much would you have been willing to pay in time and money to get that from somewhere else? It was amazing to me, the faculty responses and the students' responses. So in terms of in-person resources, looking at the last, most recent use of an in-person resource, what's fresh in your mind as a faculty member? On average, faculty were willing to pay 169 minutes of time, in other words, getting in their car and you know, driving somewhere to get that resource for somewhere else, and an average of $67 for that in-person resource. For the remote resources, so logging into the library and getting access to that resource, faculty would have been willing to pay 94 minutes on average and $30 to get that resource from somewhere else. These are it's amazing and overwhelming the response that we got from faculty and students. I was very pleased with these responses. Students, as you might expect, willing to pay less. They don't have as much money. They don't have as much time. They feel as though they can get everything they need on the web from Google. But students were willing to pay 35 minutes on average and $5, you know, better, better than zero. Surprising results, but very strong results for access to the most recent in-person resource they got from going to the, physically to the academic library. And they were willing to pay an average of 32 minutes and $13 for the resource they got online from the academic library. So if we can advance the slide. Now, we, I, I don't know if there are any questions about that, but I do want to sort of move us forward to what does that mean for the return on the academic library at Syracuse University. 
Well, we take those answers. Um, we have to wait the responses to the survey because the survey was slightly different. Survey responses were slightly different than the overall population at the university. So I have to use a statistical technique to weight those responses. I have to use another statistical technique to make to average that out over the year because obviously asking people at peak hours during the peak time is not at, like asking them during the summer. So we have to average that out over the course of the year, their use of those resources. We have to take those values, multiply it by the use, multiply it by the number of faculty, take the values from the students, multiply it by their use using turnstile counts or web logs for student use and for faculty use, then multiply it by the number of students to get the total, total value from academic resources used. So the annual value, looking at this table, the annual value to faculty at Syracuse University in time of in-person use is $10.2 million per year back in 2010-11. The total value of in-person use and money is $3.4 million. For a total value to the faculty at Syracuse University of the academic library for in-person use of $13.6 million and a total value of remote use to faculty of $19 million per year. And if you look at the students, those numbers are significantly higher, um, particularly for in-person use, but that's only because we have a lot more students. Syracuse University has 21,000 students, about 1,000 full-time faculty. So in total for students, the physical library is worth about $23.1 million per year to those students, whereas remote access to the library is, 14 point, is, is worth $14.5 million uh, to students per year based on contingent valuation. We also did uh, a study of, as part of this study, uh, how did you get to the academic library? How, how, how many times do you remotely log in? And what if instead of allowing you to remotely log in, you have to physically use the library to get an estimate of the environmental impact of that use? And then when you physically visit the library, how do you visit it? Do you drive? Do you walk? Do you bike? Do you take public transportation? And doing calculations on all the ways that you get to the physical library, because if I take away remote use from you, you know, what are the various ways that you get to the physical library as a faculty member or as a student? And so to measure the environmental savings from providing remote access. At Syracuse University back in 2010-11, that value is $1.6 million per year to faculty and $3.7 million per year to students. And I should say, you know, that value to the environment is $3.7 and $1.6 million. And then finally, we played the thought experiment, too, of, you know, what if, what if you don't have digital access, access to anything? Even going to the physical library, no digital access, you're going to have to look at these things physically and print them out or, you know, print out what you don't already print or potentially photocopy some of the things that you would physically access. Again, a series of questions about your behavior and what if I had to substitute that with um, physical use. Um, and we estimated that the value to faculty is about $100,000 per year and about $700,000 a year per stu for students annually of doing that. Now, we did not estimate the social value. <laughs> I sometimes call that the icing on the cake. The, the value of the academic library is really the use of the library, and then we get more value from the environmental use of the library, and then the icing on the cake is the social value. So that's, that's sort of even more. So when we add up all those values that we know that the total value may be $34.3 million to faculty and $42.0 million to students, well, that would be even greater if we found a way to measure the social value. Right? That would be even greater than that. All of these estimates, I should say, are very conservative estimates of value to faculty and students. So what does that mean? Well, back in 2010-11, the uh, library at Syracuse had an annual budget of about $17 million. When we look at the economic value to 
adding together what the students say and what the faculty say, that's about $70.2 million annually in, in value in benefit. So the return on investment just on the private benefit to the users would be 4.13. You get that by dividing 70.2 by 17. You get an ROI of 4.13 to the library. If you include the environmental value as we've estimated it, that's a total of $76.3 million. And the ROI is 4.49. Uh, and clearly, if you were to include the social value, if we were to add that in there, you know, we would hopefully get an ROI of 5.0 or more by adding that last piece of the coin. So that's the, that's the comprehensive value to the academic library at Syracuse University using the contingent value method fairly standard and well-known and reputable method out of economics that's particularly used for uh, uh, valuing the environment. What's the value of Yellowstone Park? What's the value of clean water? Uh, used extensively to measure the ROI of public libraries over the last 20 years. And now I think for the first time used to measure the value uh, of an academic library with very favorable results, very positive, very favorable results. Thank you very much, Bruce. Um, the yeah, comprehensive approach is very intriguing. Um, and um, how? What's your advice in terms of if a library had to um, to move forward in this area? When would they go for using the comprehensive approach versus when might they want to um, develop? Um, methods or even contingent evaluation of specific services, whether it's e-books or common spaces or other more specific elements? Well, and I guess the answer to that is somewhat straightforward, right? In terms of talking to the university, to the provost, to the chancellor, to the president about what does the library do for the institution, having a simple straightforward number, this is the ROI. We've measured it. We show this. Uh, or even just simply using at least the ROI from Syracuse University and saying, hey, there's a study out there. This is the return on investment that uh, we're getting from our library. It's helpful in determining the overall library budget. But as you're making decisions within the library, and I know many academic libraries are facing those decisions of, you know, do we want to spend more on our library commons or devote more space to it? Uh, we're faced with this, you know, large price tag for these uh, online journals, and uh, is it really worthwhile to pay for all these online journals? Or what are our special collections worth to us? It's important to drill down on specific services. Um, that's where Don's research is so valuable, actually, is that he provides cost estimates for for individual services, and that's where the value of many of these other live value studies are coming in. Of, you know, how do we figure out whether people are using the commons and valuing it or its impact in education, what our resources and services in education? So that, that's the time when you're making individual decisions about investment within the library budget of this versus that. That's the time, I think, perhaps to go to the individual studies. Although I do have to say that those individual studies also provide great ammunition in terms of going to the provost and going to the chancellor and justifying you know, the library's budget. Hey, you, know, you see what our library commons is doing for us? Do you understand what access to these resources are, are the impact that's having on our research on campus? Do you realize that all of these uh, workshops and training programs that the library is offering and, and how impactful it is in terms of graduation and education on this campus? There is an, uh, an audience question that uh, asks um, about how this ROI figure compares to what businesses expect out there. Is there uh, an expectation in terms of um, what most ROI studies across industries show or in other specific industries? Um, I don't think there's an expectation across the board. I mean, I, so I'm very familiar with the entrepreneurship and venture capital and angel investment gain. And, and uh, you know, angel investors and venture capitalists always look for that tenfold return. 
You know, they want a tenfold ROI, an ROI of 10 or more. But they want that ROI of 10 or more because if they have a portfolio of 10 investments, 9 out of 10 are failing. And so they look for the one that's successful to make up for the, the, you know, the ROI of zero on the other nine in their portfolio. That's not the way we can look at, at a library investment, right? We, we don't expect that you know, nine out of the ten of investments on a campus are going to fail on us, and so we, we hope to have a 10, uh, an ROI of 10 on our academic library to make up for the, for the failure with our IT investment or elsewhere. Um, these are very strong and very positive ROIs. And recognize that an ROI of one means that for every dollar I put in, I get a dollar of benefit back, right? So I'm benefit, I'm sort of square. And that's, you know, that's a very minimum level of which I would make a purchase of a, of a car, of a book, or anything else for me individually. So anything greater than one is good news. Anything less than one is bad news, but anything greater than one is good news. And as I said before, we've seen this in the public library domain over and over again, typically with ROIs of, of about the same level. And it's been very positive news for public libraries, and I think used very successfully in terms of justifying local public library budgets. I would like to actually go to one of your earlier slides, because I think the next question that's coming relates to, to that. Um, it's about um, knowledge or examples of measuring the value of efficiencies or the savings experienced by users through use of the library. And um, if I go back to the slides, I'm going to bring up the one where um, you were discussing um, the, how much the faculty and the students were willing to pay, and would you? So incorporated into that, so there's there's two ways to look at the value of a public good. Uh, one is to try and measure out, you know, in the case of the library, uh, try and measure out the savings that we might achieve. Try and measure out uh, the impact it has on retention, and then saying, well, we retain the student, and therefore. You know, they're going to pay us X amount in tuition, and this is going to be meaningful by this amount. Or try and figure out their increased success in the job market. Hey, they got it. Because we have a great library, they're getting paid an extra $1,000 per year. They wouldn't have gotten that without a great library. The, nice, the reason I like uh, contingent valuation method is because it's going directly to the user and saying, what do you think this is worth to you? What is it worth to you? And that individual, hopefully, is incorporating to their decision process the fact that it's saving them time and money. And in fact, that's the way the, the survey question is asked. Um, if, if, if we no longer had an academic library and you were forced to get this from another source, one, would you have gotten it? And two, if you were to have, you know, it's so important to you that you would have gotten it from somewhere else, how much would you have been willing to pay in time and money to, to do that? Um, so asking the individual makes it a very personal decision for them and gets them to think about what is the value to them rather than it being us making a calculation of the time savings or the benefits, et cetera, et cetera. We are getting directly from the user what they might be willing to, willing to spend along those lines. Thank you. There is another question asks whether uh, the NROI number has been used in any academic library to and that led to improved support and budget increases. And uh, at this point, I want to say that uh, one of our co-principal investigators, Paula Kaufman, who um, uh, has been leading this effort, um, is the one that says we're not there yet. Um, you know, I haven't been able to take this figure to my provost and get an increased budget. But we are at sort of the beginnings of understanding these arguments and uh, eventually using them. Although I do um, want to uh, to mention that there is definitely um, a, a lot more focus about uh, you know delivering value to the students as more and more libraries are introducing library fees. Uh, so even implicitly, the link is there. Um, there is one more question. Have there been any 
unintended consequences in bringing up how much library services are worth to users. Any danger of cost shifting from institution to users coming up as a possible solution to funding? Chris, do you want to respond? I, I, I'm not certain I know the answer to that question. I mean, you know, clearly that's a, a possibility. Uh, but I think the, the question is it's still worthwhile to ask what people are getting uh, from their library, how, how they value it. Uh, whether it's to go to a provost and say, therefore, we need more resources, or whether it's to say, hey, we do need a library fee. Yeah, times are tough, and, and financially things are difficult. And, uh, you know, quite frankly, all students and their parents are very upset about the level of tuition, so we cannot raise tuition this year. Um, but for those services that students use, um, if, the, if they recognize that it has value to them, then maybe it is willing to, we are willing to, you know, place a fee on this. Well, one, one, of the, one of the most valuable resources that we have at Syracuse University, and I think some people will laugh at this, but it's true, is our basketball team. And we certainly charge a fee every time people use that uh, when they go to a basketball game. Uh, should we charge a fee annually imposed on students for the value of the academic library, I think at least the students at Syracuse University might not be too upset. I mean, yeah, you're going to get some, some pushback, but I would suggest that uh, they, they find so much value in the resource that they might be willing to accept that. It obviously would have to be implemented very carefully, as it would on any campus. So. And one last question. Uh, someone is asking if, there, if we know whether there is any differentiation uh, in the value um, calculations for undergraduate and graduate students? There is a difference. Um, so I have all that data, too. I have it broken down by students in various majors, uh, graduate and undergraduate students, online students versus campus students. So I have the breakdown of all that. And it's not surprising to find out that graduate students are willing to pay more than undergraduate students are. Um, I should say this, too, that something I forgot to mention is that uh, uh, one of the things that Don and I um, uh, uh, cheerfully disagree on is the fact that in valuing out the time, you have to translate that into a dollar figure. And I place a value on student time of $10 per hour and showing out the uh, value of time to students, the dollar value of time to students of using the library. Uh, Don reminds, thinks that that is way too low of a number. That's, that it should be a much higher number in valuing students' time, but I, I'm, I, I think it's important to use the conservative number and see where we're at. So my estimates tend to be very conservative, and the ROI is very low and very defendable because I use conservative estimates along the way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bruce. Uh, it basically means, you know, the, the real value is much larger. You mentioned we are not even taking into account the social value. Uh, component. There was actually a person that um, commented uh, asking if we want, if we plan to capture the social value at some point. And clearly, there is a lot more work to do in all of these areas. Um, now, um, many libraries we know look at specific services, as uh, Bruce mentioned, and as John's methodology is uh, developing. And we have a poll question for you regarding um, how you go about uh, valuing specific services. Amy? Yes, the final poll question asks, uh, which one new service is a priority for your library to assess? Uh, either access to ebooks, a new library common space, new services to help faculty teaching and student learning, increased access to special collections, or none of these but access to other resources. We're getting some. All right, we'll wait another moment and stop the question. And of the 37 responses, 15% uh, place a priority on ebooks, 17% on common spaces, 53% on new services to help faculty teach, uh, just 5% on special collections, and 7% on other. 
Thank you. Uh, and I will take one more question. Bruce, if you are here, this is an interesting one. It says, should libraries pursue price sensitivity and awareness? Do you have any thoughts on that? Can you repeat that question? Should libraries pursue price sensitivity, price sensitivity analysis, I assume, and awareness? I'm, I'm not sure what awareness. Yeah, I, 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 I'm a big believer in that. I'm, I uh, harp on it with tuition uh, at my own institution constantly. That we have to be very, we have to measure price sensitivity on tuition. That will, that will tell us what the future holds. And so anybody that's providing a service, um, you know, and charging a fee for it should be aware of price sensitivity. You know, the other sensitivity is sort of time sensitivity too, right? As libraries can provide things more efficiently, faster, uh, should see an increase in use, but also should see an increase in value from those services. So it's, you know, it's the parallel to price sensitivity is time sensitivity of use. Mm -hmm. Yep, time is money. Thank you. Now, uh, so we talked about a lot of good reasons for uh, studying value. We do have uh, a website. I encourage all of you to go there. Um, it captures the rationale behind all these studies faced with difficult economic times and university budget because the value of the library to the wider goals of the university is increasingly questioned. So we need good tools. Uh, now, the tools do not always mean just, you know, one number out there. You know, there's a whole set of assumptions and approaches. Um, Rachel Applegate uh, from Indiana University is quoted here uh, having uh, said, I hesitate to hang the future of libraries on a demonstrable effect size for the equation L equals success, it says. Um, so, no, it, it is not clearly that simple. Uh, we do need to capture value in a strategic way. And uh, I think Bruce mentioned about our ability to innovate and um, uh, how we can use the lib value results strategically is a big challenge um, that's lying ahead of us. Uh, so it's not only about um, having uh, the methods and the data, but it's also being aware of the questions that are behind the decisions. Um, the slide here, um, I recently, yesterday, attended um, a session uh, by um, Robert Morrison, who wrote a book called Analytics at Work. And he's placing um, the awareness of um, the questions behind decisions at the level of information and at the underlying level of insight. And there are those questions uh, that are asking about the past. So in terms of information, you just want to find what happened um, and report on that. Um, on the other hand, in terms of the insight that that information can give you regarding the past, you're really interested in how and why did something happen. How and why did libraries over the last uh, 500 years have been building the Alexandrial ideal of, you know, the large print, uh, more is better type of model. Understanding that is the insight. Now, questions regarding the present, when it comes to the information you need there, you're basically asking, what is happening now? Can we get information about what's happening now? But in terms of the insight you want to have once you have that information is about what's the next best action that you can take. Given what's happening now, you want to know what you need to do in the future. And of course, we often want information about the future, what will happen, so we will ask that, and we try to extrapolate but the underlying insight we want to gain from that is what's the best or worst thing that can happen so we can predict, optimize, and um, uh, simulate. So it, it's, it's about having good data, having good models, but ultimately it's about um, also understanding the decisions and the actions uh, you want behind it. 
and he also had a, a very encouraging and uh, blissful final uh, saying uh, in his presentation, Robert Morrison's presentation, uh, indulge your curiosity, influence your friends, enable your organization, and may your analytics always be good and your judgment even better. So data uh, without judgment is not that good, so I hope your judgment is always um, uh, as, at least as good as your data and most of the time better than your data. And uh, I hope you will also join us on June 13th for the Leap Value webcast on success in teaching and research. Uh, Carol Tanopier uh, will uh, be at that webcast. And we want to thank you for attending today's webcast. Have a great day.